it was a Wednesday evening. I remember this because it was our first life group service project and it didn't go exactly as planned. And so I hadn't had time to eat dinner yet. And so it, I was particularly hungry after the kids finally went to bed. And I made a mistake. Instead of going to the fridge where the like healthy food is, I went to the pantry and I opened up the cupboards and up on the top shelf, it called to me this bright, beautiful blue bag of Munchie Mix. And I knew it would be a mistake to reach up there and grab that bag of Munchie Mix, but before I knew it, it was in my hands. And I knew it would be a mistake to open it, but when I looked, it was already open, and I thought, this must be a sign. And I knew that I should like exercise some portion control and take that Munchie Mix and pour a little bit into a bowl, but I was too lazy and too hungry. I thought I might die. So I didn't have time to go around the cupboard and get the bowl out of the cupboard. I just thought, I, I, can, I can control myself. I'll just take a little bit out of the bag while I watch some TV. And before I knew it, I was scraping the bottom of the bag. And the thing is, I knew partway through, I knew that I was in trouble because I, I realized I was eating mindlessly, but by that time, there was so little left that it wasn't worth saving, and so the only logical thing to do was just keep on going and eat it. And as I lay there in bed that night with powdered cheese and processed carbs congealing in the pit of my gut, Romans came to mind. <laughs> in particular, Romans chapter 7 where Paul says this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. See, this wasn't the first time that I've had this experience. And, and I know that Paul's not just talking about my habit of, of loving processed cheese and processed carbohydrates, but, but he's talking about other things that I know that are happening in my life, these habits that rear their ugly heads, stereotypes, words that come out of my mouth, things that I hate to do. And it made me wonder, are we really free? Are we as free as we think we are, as we would like to be? We would like to be free. Freedom, autonomy, independence, ability to make our own decisions, ability to make our own way in life. All of these are kind of ultimate values in our society today. In fact, it's even on the New Hampshire license plate. Prior to, to 1971, this was the motto on New Hampshire's license plate, scenic New Hampshire. So it sounds like a nice place to visit and you might want to go. It's scenic. After 1971, they decided they needed to imprint it with their state motto, live free or die. Seems like a pretty stark choice. But the reality is that, that this isn't, they're not alone in this. This has been the rallying cry of countless revolutions. Freedom or death. But are we really free? Are we as free as we think we are? We like to see ourselves as free, as independent, as autonomous individuals. We like to believe that we make our own decisions, that we make our own way, that we're responsible for our own successes and even responsible for our own failures. We get this from a very young age. Those of you who have experienced toddlers, you know that they want to do it themselves and they want to decide for themselves. We want to be free. And this is not true just of individuals. It's also true for groups of people, for cities, for states, for, for, for nations. It's even true in churches. Right in our preamble of the Statement of Faith for the Evangelical Free Church of Canada, it says this, we are an association of autonomous churches. We have the freedom to govern our own affairs as individual churches because we value freedom. We value autonomy. But are we really free? Are we as free as we think we are? And if we think about it for a moment, we recognize that there are all kinds of limitations. There are all kinds of things that exert their control on us in various ways. Some of them come from the outside. They're external limitations, the expectations of others, relationships with other people. Uh, school exerts expectations and limits on us. You have to show up at a certain time and you have to do a certain amount of work. Work exerts some expectations. Again, you have to show up in time. You have to do the work in order to get paid. Family exert some expectations. It's striking to me how many times in premarital counseling we have to wrestle through with the couple that we're counseling how much it means when they get married that they're no longer free, that they're responsible for one another, that they can't just do what they want in the same way. Market forces exert influence over us. 
all of a sudden our job disappears or our savings disappear. And we'd like to believe we make our own way, that we made our own decisions, but sometimes things intervene. It's not always from the outside either. Sometimes there's internal forces, habits, appetites, desires that rear their ugly head. And just like Paul, we find ourselves doing things that we do not want to do and we don't understand how we got there. And it seems like there is some irresistible force at work inside of us. And Paul says, that's precisely it. That's precisely the problem. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, which we're looking at this morning, he says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, and then he stops. He starts to make this comparison, sets it up, and then he completely interrupts himself and stops. And I think what he's doing is he wants to stop to make sure that his audience, the, the Christians who are, who are following Jesus in the church in Rome about 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, he wants to make sure that they understand that from the time of Adam, all of humanity up until the present time has been subject to the reign of death. And Paul introduces the idea and then he unpacks it a little bit further in the following verses. But he uses this word sin in various ways in his letters. And sometimes it can be a bit confusing. Sometimes he's talking about those individual acts that we, that we commit, those, those acts of rebellion or disobedience, those individual things that we do. But often, and in this section, he's using this word almost exclusively to describe a force that has been unleashed on this world that all human beings are subject to. Paul uses death in in a similar way. Again, sometimes when he uses the word death, he's talking about the physical dying, but but here in this section and almost exclusively throughout this section, he's talking about this culture of death, this, this culture of decay and destruction, this reign of death that all humans are subject to. And according to Paul, this reign of sin and death is the irresistible force that is at work in our lives that makes us do things that we don't want to do. You might wonder, well, how did we get here? Surely this is not how we were created. And, and Paul is really clear. He blames one man. And when he gets down throughout the passage, you see that the person he's talking about is Adam. And he's taking us back to the garden. He, he reminds us that, no, we weren't created for this. We weren't created to be ruled by sin and death. We were created to, to bear the image of God, the likeness of God. And that when we were created, God gave us a mandate to to fill the earth with his glory, to fill the earth with his likeness. And then in Genesis tells us to rule the world under God's authority. This is what we, we were created for. And when Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden, God gave them one particular instruction. He said, you can eat from every tree in this garden, but from this tree of the knowledge of of good and evil, you cannot eat from it. Just don't eat from that one. And the serpent enters the picture and he sees his opportunity. And he tempts Adam and Eve to disobey God. And he tempts them with this, that if you eat from this tree, you will be like God. You will be free. You won't have to rely on God anymore to determine what's right and wrong. You can decide for yourself. You can be independent. You can be autonomous. Instead of seeking God's glory, you can can just seek your own glory. You can make a name for yourself. And Adam and Eve look at the tree and they see that it looks good to eat and that they desire it to make them wise, that they desire it to make them free and independent and so they eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Paul describes this act as an act of disobedience. It's, It's clear. God gave them a command, they disobeyed it. But he also describes it as an act of rebellion because when they ate from the tree, they they were saying to God, not just we we don't want to obey you, but, but we don't want to be ruled by you. We want to make our own rules. We want to decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. And further, Paul describes this in Romans chapter 2 as an act of idolatry. Now, they didn't bow down to a statue or an image, but they took took something and they they gave ultimate significance and ultimate allegiance to something that was not God. They put something else in God's place. They, They put themselves in God's place. We want to be the center. We want to decide. They put knowledge, particularly the knowledge of good and evil, as something that was ultimately significant, ultimately important in their lives. We must decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. And they put autonomy at the center. They made autonomy ultimately significant, ultimately important. We want to rule ourselves. 
and ultimately they made it ultimately important in their lives, the ultimate allegiance to it because they gave their lives for it. And the result is, because of their disobedience, because of their rebellion, because of their act of idolatry, death reigns over all humanity. Paul says this in verse 17, by the trespass of the one man. Trespass, you understand what this means. If you trespass on somebody's property, you've crossed a boundary that you are not lawfully able to cross. And so that's what Paul compares, uh, or Paul compares Adam's act to. He crossed a boundary that he was not lawful, lawfully allowed to cross. By the trespass of the one man, death reigned through the one man. Death reigned. You see, rather than freeing humans from outside control, our idolatry, our rebellion, our trespass unleash the power of death on this world. Rather than, than, than ruling under God's authority, second to God, we became ruled by death. We became overruled by it and it reigns. This is part of the reason that we find ourselves doing things that we do not want to do because we are not as free as we think we are. Now, you might be wondering, is this, is this fair? Is it fair that, that one man's decision should, should cause us all to be, to be under the same penalty, to be under the same reign of death? We need to understand that in the ancient world and still today in much of our, our world outside of Western civilization, outside of Western society, that they understand that we are not really autonomous, independent individuals. You see, when we meet somebody in our, in our culture, we ask them, what's your name? And then immediately, usually, we ask them, what do you do? What do you do for a living? What do you do? Because we believe they're an independent individual and, and basically they're defined by what they do. In the ancient world and in still much of the world today, the, the second question after what's your name is, who are your people? Who is your family? Where do you come from? Because they understand that, that we're much more connected to our families, that we're affected by our ancestors. And so they would have no problem with Paul's argument in verse 19 of the passage that says, through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. Let me try to illustrate it for you this way. My parents lived in Canada and were Canadian citizens, still are Canadian citizens. And so when I was born, I automatically became a Canadian citizen. I didn't have to take an oath. I didn't have to take classes. I didn't have to sign any papers. Being born to Canadian citizens made me a Canadian citizen. In a similar way, because our father, Abraham, or father Adam pardon me, took out citizenship in the kingdom of death. When we are born into that family, we automatically become citizens of that kingdom. And because we are citizens of the reign of death, we get all of the benefits, if you want to call it that, of the reign of death. Paul says that our destiny, because we are citizens of the reign of death, includes death, verse 12, judgment, verse 16, and condemnation. This is the characteristics of the reign of death. After making sure that we understand that all humans are subject to this reign of death, Paul comes back to the comparison that he interrupted at the beginning of our passage in verse 18. He says this, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. And then he continues, verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. This one righteous act, this, this act of, of obedience is, is what Paul describes in, in the letter to the church in Philippi is, is obedience to death, even death on a cross, which is ultimately obedience to the Father's will. And what Paul is arguing here is that, that because Jesus was obedient to the Father's will, Jesus rescues us from the reign of death so we can reign in life. Notice these verses tell us that Jesus' obedience rescues us, but it doesn't tell us how Jesus' obedience rescues us. In fact, as you read through Scripture, the, you'll find that the early church used all kinds of metaphors to, to try to explain what Jesus' death and how Jesus' death accomplishes this for us. It, it uses the metaphor of the, of the slave market, that Jesus' death paid the required ransom to purchase our freedom so we could be free. 
They use the metaphor of the temple, that, that Jesus' death was the necessary sacrifice to forgive our sins so that we could be made righteous, so that we could be forgiven. They use the metaphor of the law, of the legal system, that Jesus' death satisfies the requirement of the law so that we can be declared not guilty, so that we can be declared just. It uses the metaphor of war, that Jesus' death conquers the forces of sin and death and gains us victory so that we can live in freedom. And throughout history and in various parts of the world, the church has, has grabbed onto and emphasized certain ones of these metaphors to explain Jesus' death. But I think that what the Bible is telling us, what the, what the early church is telling us is that there is no one metaphor that completely captures what Jesus did for us. There are no words that will completely describe what Jesus did when he died on the cross and when he rose again, for, rose again for, to give us new life. This is why we will spend all of eternity celebrating his rescuing us from the reign of death. Because there will always be new things to discover. There will always be new experiences of his grace. There will be new depths of his love that we discover. And as we share them with one another, we will celebrate together. We will never, ever be done. Paul says that Adam's disobedience means that death reigned. And Jesus' obedience means that grace now reigns. And our eternal destiny is determined by which kingdom we are a part of. If we belong to Adam, we're under the reign of death. And therefore, our eternal destiny is death, judgment, and condemnation. But if we belong to Jesus, we are now under the reign of grace. And it changes our destiny. We see this in, in verse 19 of our passage. It says this, For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, I explained that already, we became citizens of the kingdom of death, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Through the obedience of Jesus, our identity is completely changed. Our character is completely transformed. We experience this inner transformation and we become righteous. Paul, Paul continues on and he says uh, in verse uh, 17, I believe, he says this, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, there's the destiny of those who belong to the kingdom of death, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Justification is now our, our destiny as citizens of the kingdom of grace, as the reign of grace. And we talked a little bit about this last week. It means that we have, we have been declared not guilty, but that's only part of the new status that we have. Because the, the, it wasn't just an objective legal requirement, but there was a relational requirement that goes along with this. And through Jesus' obedience, we are brought back into right relationship with God. We have a new status with God. And because of this, we also have been given a new family. This is what Paul's talking about here, that we no longer are, de are descendants of Adam subject to the reign of death, but we are now descendants of Jesus subject to the reign of grace. And then we have new hope. And that's the life that Paul's talking about. And again, Paul uses life in the same way that he uses death. It's a, it's a present experience as well as a future reality that's waiting for us. Yes, someday we will enter into eternal life, but Paul argues that we get to participate in the life of the reign of grace now in our present reality. That we should increasingly reflect the reign of grace in our lives. That we should increasingly reflect the reign of grace in, in our homes, in our relationships in our homes, with our family members, with our roommates, whoever we live with, that we should increasingly reflect the reign of grace in, in God's family, the church, so that when the world looks in at us, they see grace reigning here in this place, that we should increasingly reflect the reign of grace in our relationships, in, in our world, that every time we encounter somebody, we leave a mark of grace on their life. Jesus rescues us from the reign of death so we can reign in life. This is what he says in verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Reign in life. This was God's plan right from the beginning. This is why he created humans. So they could reign under his authority. So they could reign in in life. And now through Jesus, this has been restored to us. This purpose and position that we had before Adam's disobedience has been restored to us. We see this in the word justified, which as a, as a kid, I always remembered it meant 
or help me remember what it means with this phrase, just as if I never sinned. But the problem was because I viewed myself as an independent individual, I always just thought it meant that God didn't hold my sin against me. But it means even more than that, just as if we never sinned. It means that we have been restored to the position and privilege of Adam. Just as if Adam's sin had never existed, God restores us to the destiny that he had for us. It means that we have access to God's presence once again in a right relationship with him. Not just as he walks with us in the, in the cool of the evening in the garden. Not just as he meets with us in the, in the holy of holies in the temple or, or here in this place in the church. But everywhere we go, whatever we do, God is with us and we have access to his presence and his grace. It means that we've been restored to the position of Adam, that we reign in life that we reflect God's glory to all of creation and that we act as priests in God's creation, reflecting the glory of God to creation and reflecting the praise of creation back to God. This is a high calling. The Bible describes the community of faith as a royal priesthood. You are kings and queens who reflect the glory of God and minister his presence to the people around you and the creation around you. Paul says that if you receive God's grace, that Jesus rescues us from the reign of death so we can reign in life, so that we can be restored to the purpose we were given in creation. You can have access to this reign of grace because it's available to everyone. Verse eight, in verse 18, Paul uses incredibly universal language to describe the, the reign of grace. He says this, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. What does this mean? Well, last week we learned that that Jesus' obedience makes justification, the the new status, the new family, the new hope. It makes it a reality. But for us to enter into the experience of that, we have to receive it by faith. We have to receive this gift. And Paul's point is that every descendant of Adam has access to this reign of grace through Jesus. You can have access to it because it's available to everyone. Secondly, I noticed that that this reign of grace is absolutely certain. Over and over again throughout this passage, Paul compares the the reign of death and and the effects of the reign of death to the effects of the reign of grace and says how much more the reign of grace. Look at it in verse 15, for example. He says this, If death flowed to everyone because of one trespass, how much more does God's grace overflow to everyone? Or verse 17, if death reigned through one man, how much more will we reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ? You see, this is, Paul's point is this, that those who belong to Jesus, those who are subject to the reign of grace, can be just as certain of their destiny, of the new status, the new family, the new hope, as those who belong to the reign of death. It is just as certain. He's saying that if you have received God's gift, if you have received his grace, then then you can be absolutely certain that you will reign in life because the power of Jesus to rescue you from the reign of death is more powerful, is greater than death's power to enslave you. Jesus rescues us from the reign of death so we will reign in life. The third thing I want you to notice about this reign of grace is that it's a gift to be received. I wonder how how many of us come to church or, or to life group or to youth group or to wherever we gather together with God's people and we feel like we don't belong. We feel like a little bit like an imposter. We know that we're supposed to reign in life. We know that God's grace is supposed to make a difference in the way that we live and in our relationships, in our homes and in our church and in our world. But, but we're not really living that way. And when we look around, it looks like everybody else has it together. It looks like everybody else is winning. It looks like everybody else gets it. They're reigning in life. And we know, you know, you're not. You're often being reigned over by something rather than reigning. And you feel like you don't belong. I want to speak to you if you feel that way. One, you're not alone. It's amazing to me how many times I hear this. It just happened again to me this week where, where somebody shared something of their brokenness and the response was, what? You too? 
I thought I was the only one. We are all broken people who are experiencing God's grace. In fact, Jesus compares the reign of grace to a banquet hall that is filled with, the, with broken people, with, with the blind and the crippled and beggars. So look around you. Look around you this morning. We are all broken people who are feasting on the grace of God. We're all broken and we just experience God's grace. Secondly, I want to say to you, it's not about cleaning yourself up and making yourself acceptable. It's about grace. It's, and grace is a gift. Let's look at it in verse 17. Paul says, we reign in life when we receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Your change in identity from sinner to righteous is a gift. The new status you have, the new relationship you have with God, it's a gift. The new family that you've been given with the new destiny that goes along with that, it's a gift. The new hope that we have in Jesus Christ, it's a gift. You just receive it. And if you've never received God's gift, you can actually do that right now where you're sitting this morning. You can change your destiny. You see, the only way to be truly free is to be reigned over by Jesus. The only way to reign in this life is to be ruled by Jesus. And so right where you are, you can tell Jesus that you need to be rescued from the reign of death. You can tell Jesus that, that you accept his gift and that you submit to him as king of your life and of this world. In fact, I want to give you a moment just to do that right now. And if you've forgotten the words that you want to say, I I'll give you some. Here, tell, just where you are, Tell Jesus that you need to be rescued from the reign of death. Tell Jesus that you accept his gift, that you're going to stop trying to earn it and you just receive it. Tell Jesus that you submit to him as king of your life and of this world. And if you said those words in your heart this morning, then you have been given a new family. Paul says that you are no longer a descendant of Adam whose destiny is judgment, death, and condemnation. That you are now a descendant of Jesus. You belong to the family of God and you've been given a new status, a new family, and a new hope. Your destiny is to reign in life under the authority of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're resisting saying those words because you're free and you refuse to be ruled by anyone or anything. The next time you find yourself doing something you don't want to do, remember that you are not as free as you think. Everyone is ruled by something. You are either subject to the reign of death or you're subject to the reign of grace and life. You choose. If you have received God's grace and the gift of righteousness, Paul says you have been rescued from the reign of death to play your proper part, to reign in life. I don't know about you, but as I look at my life, I recognize there are areas that grace does not reign in. There are habits, attitudes, relationships that reflect the reign of death more than the reign of grace. And I want to give you just a moment to reflect on, on how the relationships in your home with your family members, how the relationships with God's family in the church or, or with your world, your classmates, the people you work with or work for, how could they better reflect the reign of grace in your life? How could you leave evidence of grace as you interact with them? I want you to think, are, are there areas of your life that, that, that you are being, where you are being ruled over rather than ruling over? You're being ruled by rather than ruling? Here's the message. It's not try harder. It's not clean yourself up. It's just ask God's grace to invade that area of your life and to reign there. You see, the good news of this passage is that the reign of grace has already been gone. It's already been established by Jesus and in its establishment, it has begun to displace the reign of death. Paul says that, that where sin increased, grace increased all the more. It's right at the end of the passage. 
This means that every time you are confronted with the depth and the enormity of your sin, you can be assured that God's grace is greater than your sin. Every time that you are confronted with the power of the reign of death in your life, you can be certain that God's reign of grace is even more powerful still. It's displacing the reign of death. Every time we feel ruled by old habits, we can be reminded that if we have received God's gift, if we have received his grace, Jesus has rescued us from the reign of death. And we can reign in life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gift of grace. Thank you for making it a gift that we just have to receive. We could never earn it. We could never reach the standard required. And yet you and your love and your grace reach down to us. Lord, help us to receive your grace. Help us to receive your your gift of righteousness. And Lord, as we receive it, would you help us to live our new identity as sons and daughters of, of you, as children of the King. May our lives exhibit the reign of grace in this world and may they, may they look differently as a result. As we encounter people today after the service and as we go out for lunch or, or through our week, as we encounter people, may we leave grace behind. May your grace reign. As habits rear their ugly head, and we find ourselves doing things we do not want to do, may we experience a new measure of your grace again. Fill us with your spirit. Equip us for the calling that you have given to us. And may we reflect your glory and your grace to this world today and tomorrow and for the rest of eternity, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.